Welcome to the show Beyond the Journal, where we will discuss social media, digital education, and current controversies in cancer and medicine. I'm Dr. Jack West, Associate Clinical Professor in Medical Oncology at the City of Hope Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. And I'm happy to be joined today by my co-host, Dr. Charu Agarwal, who is the Leslie M. Heisler Associate Professor of Lung Cancer Excellence at University of Pennsylvania's Abramson Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Hi, Charu. Hi, Jack. And today it's my pleasure to have on the show Dr. Sanjay Popat, who's the Professor of Thoracic Oncology at the Institute of Cancer Research. Welcome to the show, Sanjay. It's, it's such a pleasure to have you. Hi, Charu. Hi, Jack. It's great to be here. Well, thanks. We're uh, going to just mix it up and talk about the controversies around a, a very timely, uh, very positive trial, but one that's also left us with some questions about the implications, what they are, what they should be, and that's the ADORA trial. And uh, just to introduce folks, uh, we're trying to reach out to people beyond just a focus on thoracic oncology. And I think that uh, this trial brings up a lot of topics that are, are broader than that. But uh, by means of introduction, the ADORA trial looks at adjuvant osimertinib, the third generation EGFR inhibitor, given to patients with uh, an EGFR mutation positive early stage, that is stage 1B to 3A, resected non-small cell lung cancer. They could have received but weren't required to have uh, undergone adjuvant chemotherapy, which is one of the questionable points of it. And then patients were randomized one-to-one to up to three years of adjuvant osimertinib or placebo. Uh, the primary endpoint of the study was disease-free survival, and the trial was terminated early. We heard about that in April. That was based on a review by the uh, data review, uh, the, the uh, safety board, uh, which reviewed that and found a, an overwhelming benefit for disease-free survival in the osimertinib arm that led to a discontinuation of enrollment, but continued uh, conduct of the trial. And the, the study was presented by Dr. Roy Herbst in the plenary session at ASCO, where we saw that it was a, an overwhelmingly positive study with a disease-free survival hazard ratio of 0.17 for the subset of patients, about two thirds who had stage two or three A disease, it was 0.21 or so for the patients when you included stage 1B, who had a better prognosis overall. Uh, and then we, uh, in more recent weeks, have seen the New England Journal publication. The numbers changed slightly, but the overall uh, conclusions didn't. And we also had in the New England Journal paper and the presentation at ESMO data on the CNS relapse rate being significantly lower in the patients who received osimertinib. So uh, at this point, and this is being recorded in the end of, of October uh, uh, 2020, it's not FDA approved. It's not approved in any setting uh, that uh, in any uh, uh, part of the world right now for adjuvant therapy, but we would expect to have approvals coming soon. And certainly it's something that uh, oncologists all over the globe are looking at the data and weighing the, uh, how they interpret it. And, and, and I have been part of some debates on Twitter uh, around ASCO and subsequently, and, and I'll just state the point that I think it's pretty incontrovertible that the results are extremely positive. I've already said that for disease-free survival, it's not just borderline and statistically significant, but we have not seen an, a hazard ratio in that range of 0.2 in this setting previously. Uh, so that's 
tremendous. The overall survival data that were presented are very early, too early to interpret and will take years to, to really disentangle. So we are left right now with a surrogate endpoint uh, and not, I would say, the endpoint that we would love to have, but we constantly have to deal with some degree of uncertainty in clinical practice with the data we have relative to what we would love to have to answer every question. So that's an issue. But my, I think my, my leading concern is that disease-free survival, certainly in this setting, tells less than I would hope to. It's great, but it's also looking at patients who were a median of 22 months into their three years of treatment. And we know that osimertinib is a spectacularly active drug in stage four disease. It works really well. It's well tolerated, which I think is a particular benefit in the adjuvant setting relative to some of the other agents that have been tested up until now and are more cumbersome to give for years at a time. Um, but how, how impressive is it really to have disease-free survival look great in the midst of ongoing treatment that may just be suppressive. So I'd start with you, Sanjay, and, and then of course, Charu, you can chime in uh, about you know, how concerned you are about this or whether that to you is a technicality and, and you're way more sold than not on the data. Thanks, Chuck. This is a, a really tricky one, actually, because normally for a adjuvant study, I, I wouldn't really place a huge amount of emphasis on disease-free survival. Um, we don't really have good data that disease-free survival in lung cancer at least correlates very well with overall survival. But against that backdrop, we recognize that it takes 10 years to report overall survival in an adjuvant study. Now, 10 years is a long time for us as investigators to wait uh, for and patients to wait for when the pace of drug development and genomic discovery is really huge. I mean, where we are now compared to 10 years ago in the metastatic setting is a completely different, different place. So the question I've really got is, is it, is it valid to have disease-free survival as a primary endpoint? And that, in part, is influenced by the magnitude of benefit that you see in the study. Now, what we've got in this particular study is a spectacular DFS benefit, a, a DFS benefit that has been unheard of in an adjuvant trial in lung cancer to date. Point two is, is huge, and I don't think we'd be so excited if we'd seen a DFS hazard ratio of, let's say, 0.7 or even 0.6. I think there would still be quite a lot of debate, but at 0.2 and 0.17, you know, we really are seeing massive benefits. Now, the key issue is, of course, osimertinib delays the time until relapse. That's what the trial has shown, spectacularly so. Um, and we're not surprised at that because we've already got some uh, evidence from previous uh, EGFR mutant uh, adjuvant trials that this would uh, be the case. But will it make people live longer? Will it uh, increase the cure rate? That's what we as oncologists really want to know because that's what's really going to have long-term meaningful outcomes for our patients, at least we hope. But, you know, my worry is with the design of the study and the, such a spectacular benefit in halting uh, the study early and releasing the results is I don't think we're ever going to get a clear answer on overall survival, uh, mainly because um, the patients that uh, were not on osimertinib may or may not go on to osimertinib. Uh, patients that weren't on osimertinib uh, may relapse and may have an opportunity to cross over to receive the, uh, the drug. And patients that discontinued three years of osimertinib who then relapse will probably at some stage receive osimertinib as well. So multiple competing post-primary endpoint uh, biases which will confound overall survival, which make it very difficult to interpret. So in some ways, it's a really strongly positive study, but in many ways, it raises more questions uh, about the natural history of this disease than the answers we've got. 
Yeah, so I completely agree with both of you that, you know, I think for a study like this, overall survival should be an endpoint. And, you know, we are seeing these, these results uh, when treatment was, um, you know, you know, it was an early unblinding of data, you know, um, and I agree with you, Sanjay, that the DFS benefit is immense. It's huge. It's uh, not something that we have seen in this setting for lung cancer in the adjuvant setting ever before. And I think it speaks to um, the efficacy of the drug, which we've all seen and experienced in the stage four setting. I, I will say that, uh, you know, I don't really doubt that we'll see an overall survival advantage based mainly on the magnitude of DFS advantage that we are seeing here. I mean, I think uh, uh, the hazard ratio that we are seeing is uh, just uh, commendable. And I know there's, you know, we can't really extrapolate and we'll have to wait uh, to see the overall survival data. But, you know, I think if we look at the trial design um, and we look at the arms uh, in terms of patients that received osimertinib versus those that received placebo, you know, they're very well balanced. Um, the patient populations were similar. Um, in fact, even the percentage of patients that received adjuvant chemotherapy, now we can argue that not everybody received standard of care adjuvant chemotherapy, but the percentage of patients that did or did not were very similar across the two arms. So we can, you know, confidently say that, yes, it, you know, the, you know, between those two arms, we are seeing a benefit of osimertinib, albeit only a DFS advantage at this point in time. Um, um, and I think it, to some extent, it does reflect real world uh, experience because we know that in, in the real world setting, not everyone receives adjuvant chemotherapy, even though it may be the standard of care, even though it may be um, the recommended treatment. Uh, for a majority of our patients, they do get it, but there are some that just don't qualify or just are not fit enough to receive adjuvant chemotherapy. I know, Jack, we've discussed this uh, back and forth about this issue of receiving adjuvant chemotherapy. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I would say that I, I, I don't think that this is that predicated on the adjuvant chemo story right now. I mean, the fact that we have seen data, they're in a supplement of the New England Journal that, that also show that patients did get a major DFS benefit whether they received or did not receive adjuvant chemotherapy. But what I'm more concerned about is the concept, which I think is all but inevitable, that, that both physicians and patients will interpret that they're abrogated from giving or receiving adjuvant chemotherapy if they do adjuvant osimertinib. Uh, and the fact is adjuvant chemotherapy not only has a, a proven survival benefit that we have not seen with adjuvant osimertinib at this point, but a subset analysis of JBR10, which was one of the better run definitive studies of adjuvant chemo that, that established its place, uh, showed in a subset of patients who were EGFR mutation positive that there was a, a greater benefit of adjuvant chemo in the EGFR mutation positive patients than in the wild type patients. And so I am really concerned that this will lead to a sense of complacency or really uh, uh, a, a miss, uh, a, uh, a, a detour of patients from adjuvant chemo to adjuvant osimertinib when we would be, in essence, replacing a proven survival benefit with, with a speculative one. So that, that really is a concern of mine. I, I, you know, I think that, yes, it's real world, but I, I think that the reality is that the, the practice patterns vary greatly based on where you are, and that shows it's not the biology, it's just a sense of how committed versus indifferent you are to the best treatments. Sanjay, what do you think about, you know, is this a realistic concern to you? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think um, it's very easy to 
um, misinterpret the, the trial and say, look, you don't need the adjuvant uh, chemo. The, the benefit's small. Um, the benefit for adjuvant osimertinib is huge, and the toxicities of chemo are so significant. Why bother? I mean, I can see uh, a lot of oncologists falling into that trap, um, particularly those that are quite nihilistic about the survival advantage for adjuvant chemo in the first place. I mean, don't forget, it's a real battle to try and convince people that there is a meaningful survival advantage for adjuvant chemotherapy in many parts of the world. Um, and, you know, we, we have our predefined biases, which mean we want to give a very uh, uh, non-toxic drug uh, in, in preference. And this is just playing to those biases. But we've got to remember that this trial was not designed to test the benefit of adjuvant chemo. We have no data whatsoever uh, in this. And the message has to be that if adjuvant chemotherapy is indicated uh, and the physician and the patients feel that that is appropriate, then it really should be the standard of care for patients. And what you do thereafter in terms of osimertinib is the big debate. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the question is uh, who, who sort of is responsible for ensuring that that message gets out there to our uh, colleagues uh, in the community, as well as, you know, in, in the overall oncology community, because, you know, it's very clear from the trial design that, um, you know, screening and randomization on this trial occurred after surgery. Treatment uh, decisions, especially regarding chemotherapy, had to be made um, prior to the patient being enrolled. So it wasn't uh, that, you know, yes, you could get on this trial and, you know, avoid chemotherapy. So I, I think it's a it's a big risk, Jack, but I think it's probably also us communicating educating our colleagues and making sure that we get the message out that adjuvant chemotherapy does have an overall survival advantage and we shouldn't overlook that. Well, uh, let me also bring up a, a, an issue that I think is somewhat thorny, and that is the three-year duration, which, I, I mean, I would just say that the pretest probability of this trial being positive for DFS benefit with a three-year duration of, of treatment is off the charts high. I mean, this was, to me, almost a disingenuous study in that, you know, there's no way this could fail looking at the data we had in advanced disease. Uh, we know that some patients are going to uh, be understaged, and, and I do have some concerns about, I don't, we don't know how prevalent PET scans were. We don't know how, how common uh, brain MRIs were, and to the extent that that suboptimal staging led on patients with small volume stage four disease. Of course, uh, we have, we've really established already that osimertinib is better than placebo for stage four disease. So, but that doesn't mean that it necessarily leads to a, an overall survival benefit when you can detect that disease. Uh, so, but, but three years, you know, I would say if you are giving a therapy for three years, it, it to me indicates a very different purpose than giving three months of adjuvant chemotherapy to eradicate micrometastatic disease. You do that and you're done and you go on with your life. And if you're giving therapy and you're at two years and two and a half years and the conclusion is that's not enough, if you haven't eradicated micrometastatic disease by then, you're not giving it for that reason. You're giving it to make the scans look better, make, you know, make DFS better, but that that's not necessarily curative. And I really wonder, in fact, I'm doubtful that a lot of patients and docs will be inclined to stop at three years if they're disease free, uh, if they can get away with having more of it, even if it's, you know, it doesn't matter. Somebody else is paying for it. And, you know, that is debatably challenging if it was actually helping them. But for the people who were already cured without, you know, without any treatment at all, and it's all been over treatment, essentially for that subset, I think it's quite, quite a challenge to be giving three years or indefinite therapy that costs a quarter of a million dollars per year in the US for people who may or may not do just as well treated when you see disease, if you ever do. 
Yeah, I agree with that, Jack. But you know, the the, the problem is, what does DFS mean to a patient? You know, for, for some people, DFS is absolutely critical. You know, it pushes back the time of that highly likely inevitable uh, disease recurring if they're in a high risk scenario. Imagine you got your your you know stage three incidentally found at the time of resection. Uh, you know, they're, they're high risk of of coming back, and for for some people. Um, you know, it is absolutely critical that you can push back that time until relapse as much uh, as possible, because actually the emotional burden of living with metastatic disease in what's effectively a never smoking population, the EGFR uh, mutant population, is really quite, quite, quite significant. We hear this all the time from our patients and from the advocacy uh, uh, groups as well. It's a very different scenario uh, from early lung cancer, which is detected through whichever method you've given your your chemotherapy, and then you know you're waiting for it to come back. It may never come back, but it may do. And if that if that comes back, that's when you're going to give it. So I think I agree with what what you're saying about the uh, the fact that it may just be pushing back the inevitable. But actually, maybe that's an important thing for some people and that's really no, and, and and honestly i don't doubt that and and some some on social media have pushed back and said you know if you ask patients they would rather have a long dfs the problem that i see is it's not like the doctor or the patient are paying for it the the costs go on to a third party which yeah. is everyone else who's not getting a vote and yeah. i think if you if you look at the question of what as a broader society, we have a compulsion to cover, does a DFS benefit that isn't associated with a survival benefit necessarily or, or unknown, does that bubble up among the most critical things? In the US, we spend enormous amounts of, you know, of our, our GDP on healthcare and there's more of a tolerance, but you know, you, you're participating, speaking with the regulatory bodies in the UK and in the UK and much of Europe and the rest of the world, you have a harder stance about, you know, what society will uh, deign to pay for. And so, you know, I, I would throw it back to you and say, does NICE, is NICE going to feel that DFS compels a change in practice without overall survival? And, you know, would that be a mistake if they deprioritize this? Well, I think, you know, from the from the sort of state payer uh, viewpoint in particular, NICE, they, they can only look at overall survival. And what AstraZeneca are going to have to do is somehow model the magnitude of the DFS benefit to come up with some sort of overall survival projection and, you know, good luck, because I think it's going to be, you know, very, very difficult given the number of biases that will will, will come into that. And particularly when you're looking at an HTA type of submission, what's really critical is the long-term survival. Even when we've got a trial that's reported positive OS, trying to predict the 10-year OS benefit, which is what drives the cost, the ISA, um, is really difficult, let alone when you've got a trial which has reported at you know, less than 20% of OS events, which is what's occurred here, and you're really effectively trying to make it up um, to try and model the overall survival benefit. So I think it's going to be really tough um, to get reimbursement uh, uh, from NICE. Uh, just because of the magnitude of uncertainty um, that there is about what, what happens about OS. But, you know, that's not a bad thing in some respects, because actually from a societal viewpoint, we have to pay for things that are proven uh, to have a survival advantage. Otherwise, as you point out, Jack, it's unfair for people that aren't, uh, aren't voting uh, uh, on, on, on the question. But it does raise that real significant tension because, you know, hey, if it was me, I'd probably be wanting to have the drug. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the the problem is the cost of the medication. Now, actually, if this was a Bucca tablet, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Um, I agree with you. Know, you but, but it isn't. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not, and, and it's not going to be. So, you know, what do we do? Do we wait for the Me Too's to come from, from Asia, um, where they may or may not uh, uh, um, cut the, 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 the cost in, in time? Well, we've got a track record in immunotherapy, but that doesn't seem to have happened. Everybody rises to the to the maximum cost. So, you know, the the, 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 the concept of having um, competition within within uh, reimbursement doesn't seem seem to work. So we do have this problem. 
So I would just um, push back a little bit on the duration um, issue here. So, you know, we can't argue that this is an arbitrary duration that they picked up. You know, it's three years. And uh, I would just like to point out that, you know, obviously we are far removed from some of these diseases because we don't treat them on a regular basis. But, you know, breast cancer, for example, you know, adjuvant endocrine therapies continued for a very long time. And we know that adjuvant endocrine therapy is not curing. And I mean, it's curing some people, but it, it is meant to be suppressive. And, you know, endocrine receptor or estrogen receptor positive uh, cancers do have a high chance of late recurrences, which, you know, adjuvant endocrine therapy can quote unquote suppress. Uh, sure, you're curing a great, greater majority of patients with breast cancer, but you know, we didn't really hesitate to adopt that strategy for breast cancer. Um, the but, magnitude but of survival maybe, advantage was probably slightly smaller because you're curing a much higher percentage of patients with breast cancer. You know, I, I think we see this enough that we are not curing enough patients with stage three and stage stage two lung cancer as is. So why not give patients something that will improve their quality of life, delay recurrence, um, you know, because they are probably destined to recur. They're probably destined to have poor outcomes anyway. And if we can prevent CNS recurrence, I know, Jack, you don't really uh, buy into the data of CNS um, prevention, CNS recurrence no. prevention, because not many people had baseline MRIs, and we don't actually know what, what the follow-up was for these patients. But I still feel that morbidity prevention is huge for this subset of patients. No, I think it's, I think it's an issue. I mean, I would push back on a couple of things. One, that I, I don't know. I would just step back and ask whether the absolute differences in breast cancer should be the gold standard for all of oncology because just because things have happened there doesn't mean it's the it, it's an edict from god i mean sometimes the differences of 2% at 20 years are not that clear in absolute terms and i think if if uh, ais and tamoxifen cost a quarter of a million dollars every year for 5 10 or more years it would be a more debatable point. I mean, just like Sanjay had said, if, you know, if, if osimertinib was less expensive, we would be, I would be less troubled. It's, it's not the only issue, but it's an issue. Um, with regard to the uh, CNS relapse rate, I, I think that, to be clear, I think it's entirely possible if not more likely than not, that there could be a survival benefit giving it earlier. I do think it would be the, the, the proper study should be everyone gets it early versus everyone gets access to it at the first available evidence of relapse. And we find out if giving it earlier leads to a survival benefit. If there are patients who would present with brain metastases and leptomeningeal disease and who might have a much worse outcome at that point. Okay, that's, that's uh, one way. It's also possible that the benefit of osimertinib on, on micrometastatic undetectable disease is an order of magnitude greater than it is for macrometastatic disease, even if, even if patients are not cured. So maybe that's the case. But I just want to see the right study done and and I would scream in favor of it from the highest rooftops. I think that there is a benefit uh, for, you know, the, that uh, osimertinib definitely has impressive activity in the CNS. That said, I do, I really wish that the trials, uh, this one and and others, Flora, many others, you know, were more forthright. And by that, I mean at all, transparent about the staging for, uh, you know, what, how thorough the staging was because PET scans are a part of our staging for just about every operative candidate in the U.S. and many parts of the world. And, and it's really important to identify, especially if someone is clinically stage three, uh, based on CT, whether they have more extensive disease, we have no idea. And I would presume that very few patients had good mediastinal staging. Uh, and we don't know what proportion of patients had 
uh, had a, a brain MRI, which is clearly more sensitive than a head CT, uh, to detect small volume brain metastases. If we were just to see that the relapse rate is the same, whether patients had a PET scan or not, and whether the CNS relapse rate was the same, whether they got a brain MRI or not, that would really go a long way to uh, alleviating some of my concerns about the contributions of uneven uh, staging that is clearly an advantage to the active therapy arm. But, you know, I've been whining about this for a while and, and I'll throw it out to you, Sanjay, about, I don't just mean today, but for weeks to months about the staging. And Sanjay, I don't know if you're, you know, mentally rolling your eyes uh, uh, about uh, that, that this is really not uh, a realistic concern or whether there is something to it. What do you think? Well, look, I mean, I think there are questions to be asked about the extent of staging. There are questions to be asked about the quality of surgery. And we've got a big issue about, um, you know, uh, the, the, the high quality standards that we all want our receptive patients uh, to have. Um, you know, we're, we're now introducing the R uncertain um, uh, uh, denominator for, for, for patients as a quality standard. Um, so I think, you know, the issues that you point out about PET and uh, brain M MR are valid, but I would probably uh, say, well, you know, the, the likelihood is that those issues would be balanced in the sort of size of the study that we have across uh, the arms. And I, you know, and I point out that whilst I want every patient to have an MR, uh, the current NICE guidelines for staging preoperatively say that you should only do CT scans of the brain in patients with stage one and two disease and the MR for patients with stage three disease on the basis of cost effectiveness of picking up um, um, brain mets in patients with stage, stage one and two on a, on a MR. So look, I mean, if in a, living in a utopian world, yeah, I would want everybody to have an MR. I would want them to have a PET. I would want them to have, as Rami Porter has described, optimal mediastinal staging at the time of surgery, have no uh, uncertain status uh, uh, postoperatively. I would want everybody to have adjuvant chemotherapy. I would want that balanced, and I would want patients in the control arm to have osimertinib at time of relapse, and I would want the primary endpoint to report after those patients that had relapsed. But that's not going to happen, because actually we live in a world where we and you and I are all guilty of this, want results as fast as possible. We want to be able to impact on the patients that we treat tomorrow, not in 10 years' time. So we have to make real-life um, uh, changes to our utopian design of the study to minimise the bias that each of these problems cause by assuming that there'll be um, um, bi bias which is equal across the arms um, and, and, and a design of trial which reflects what not only goes on in the great centres of the US, but also in other parts of the world, which may be a bit more challenged to have access to uh, some of the standards of care that uh, perhaps you might regard as standard. I'm just thinking of an MR in stage one disease, yeah. but it's more routine in England um, because of cost efficiency uh, uh, issues. So, yeah, there are designs in that, in, in that study. Study, but actually, I don't think that's the bigger driver um, of, of the concerns that that, that we have. Um, I take the point about the uh, brain MR. It wouldn't have been, you know, difficult for the study to have mandated everybody has a brain MR every few months, and then we'll have a clear answer of of, of what, what's going on in the CNS. But you know, they, they decided that wasn't going to be uh, uh, the, the the design. Fundamentally, the, the problem to me is not driven by those minor biases. The fundamental issue is that we have a DFS endpoint. Is a DFS endpoint a valid endpoint in lung cancer? And we have a very strong endpoint, which is reported very early. Um, and that is a real problem. But just, just to be clear, I'm not saying that there isn't a balance between the two arms. I mean, I, I, I strongly suspect that the rates of PET-CT and and brain MR are very similar between the two. But my point is, if you have small volume brain metastases that was missed because you didn't get a brain MRI and you get osimertinib, you will remain with an excellent disease-free survival 
that you won't see if you got placebo. So to the extent that patients on either arm uh, would have had small volume disease, uh, the patients on osimertinib are far better served, at least for DFS and maybe not, maybe, maybe not for overall survival by having you know, by having occult stage four disease creep onto the trial, essentially. And then, and Charu, I'll let you speak to it, but, uh, but take, take the, the, the CTONG adjuvant trial, which showed a DFS benefit with Jafitinib, but failed to show an overall survival benefit. And the DFS went down to a very low level by three and four years out for both groups. And Many of us, at least in the U.S., I think largely globally, feel like, well, that's pretty much what you'd expect to see for, for understaged patients. If you did relatively poor staging and lots and lots of patients are clinical stage three without getting a PET and you know, may or may not have had thorough surgery, you're doing a trial of Jafitinib versus chemo in stage four disease, which we already established for EGFR mutation positives, is going to be better for DFS, but not necessarily OS. Um, so that's, you know, I, I am not convinced that this trial won't echo that in some ways. I mean, DFS is just a much lower bar. It is a great, huge difference, but if if a third of the patients on the study were recruited from places where they did the CTONG adjuvant trial approach to staging, uh, I think that's, that's really going to be a limiting factor. Charu, what, what are your thoughts? I have a couple of thoughts. Um, so, you know, it, it was probably done in similar settings where, you know, the standard of care was followed and, you know, these patients probably would have done worse if they had not been on the treatment arm. Uh, and we see that, right? So I think we have to take the study for what it is. I, I completely agree with you that this is not the ideal design, but I want to echo what Sanjay said, that, you know, I think if we have active drugs, we want to be able to extend the benefit of these drugs um, to our patients. And uh, to some extent, this is the best data we have so far. And I, I agree with you that we have to wait and see how this pans out and what the overall survival advantage is. But I think it, it it's worth discussing with patients because they may want to to you know, utilize this benefit as soon as it's FDA approved. And the second thing I want to talk about is the trial design. So, you know, it doesn't really bother me as much that a, a, a trial like this has been designed in such a way. I think what, what bothers me more is that some of the arbitrary designs that we see in the stage four setting that we never even talk about. You know, why are we comparing four drugs to two drugs uh, in the stage four setting when we all know that three drugs are probably better than two drugs, right? So these four drugs should be probably compared to three drugs. And then why are we seeing approvals? I, I know the approvals come because of the primary endpoint as well as you know the way the trial was designed. I understand that. But when you have 15 drug combinations approved in the first line setting, it just becomes mind boggling. So I think I have more of a concern in that setting when we see thousands and thousands of trials being designed, comparing them to old historical standards, which are not even relevant or contemporary standards of care anymore. Let's, I want to, I want to know your thoughts about extrapolating the data, because I am sure that if I have a patient who has a tumor just a little too small to be 1B, uh, I think there's going to be a temptation to test. And uh, if you find an EGFR mutation, say, well, it's probably appropriate to give. It's going to be something that you can't not know once you know it. And, and I think it's going to be a gravitational pull to give this. I also think there will be a gravitational pull to treat beyond three years. And I can already see from you know most of my colleagues' practices that there isn't a sense that we need to just be testing for EGFR in this setting, even though that's the only one that has the evidence, but that we should be doing NGS testing for early stage. And then, well, if you find an ALK rearrangement, of course, you'd want to give electinib. If you find ROS, you know, et cetera. And, and we don't have data for these. We have uh, an extrapolation from Adora. Uh, I think 
Sanjay, there's going to be a difference between what you might be inclined to do or think we should do versus what you can practically do. But what do you think we should practically do in these situations of, say, earlier stage patients or uh, or uh, do broad molecular testing and then apply the principles of Adora to other to, to other uh, molecular drivers. I think you're absolutely right. The, 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 the temptation to extrapolate to other tumor types is, is going to be huge and the horse is bolted uh, uh, already. We haven't got any other data. Uh, in any other genomic uh, driver data sets. We don't know what the natural history is prospectively of patients with other drivers. And so as tempting as it, as, as it is to offer a, a, a adjuvant electinib for outfusion patients, I've no problem in testing for the outfusion patient, as you and I, Jack, have discussed previously. It's the testing that's critical and, and interpreting that result for the metastatic patient. So test whenever you want to test, but you don't necessarily have to action that to an adjuvant uh, decision-making, at least not yet, because we have, don't have the data. One area you haven't talked about, Jack, is the rare EGFR mutant patients. I mean, look, you know, uh, uh, Adora was only in the Dell 19 and L858R. What are you going to do for a G719X? So, you know, when they pop up, are you going to are you going to give them uh, uh, three years of adjuvant osimertinib? Uh, because it will happen, and you'll get a telephone call from your colleagues, so you'll be seeing that patient for a second opinion, and and that's part of the great uncertainties. Uh, that we have, I would be, you know, very uh, uh, encouraged to say, look, let's stick to the data that we have. Then there may be some graying of the boundaries. So let's say you had a patient who was just under the one B margin, but had um, visceral pleural heavy infiltration on the elastin stain, a high risk tumor. Well, you know, I can understand why you'd want to give that patient um, adjuvant osimertinib. Um, but you know, for a for a low risk tumor, lower it than the standard one B risk. I'm not sure I'd be pushing the boundary that much, and certainly not uh, cross interpreting the data to uh, other tumor types. But you know, hey, I'd, I'd really be interested in, in Cherry's thoughts as well. Yeah. So I would like to push back on that a little bit. You know, I know the EGFR status for all of my patients with locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer that are currently getting chemo rads, and I'm thinking about consolidation immunotherapy. And I'm not giving them osimertinib, even though their risk of disease recurrence is so much higher than a stage one patient. So I would say that I think the, the risk of extrapolation is all, always there. Um, but I think if we are following the data, we have to follow the data, right? So if we are going to use it in stage two and stage three, I think Laura will read out at some point in time and we'll have results in the locally advanced setting. But till we do... Um, I'm not inclined yet to use osimertinib in that setting. Um, I do have a very clear discussion, and I've actually held back on giving patients um, And I've, I've just said, listen, I, I, I don't think that you're going to benefit from dervalumab, and let's just hold off. And unfortunately, uh, one, of, one or two of them have had, uh, have had development of metastatic disease where, you know, it's been a good idea to not give them dervalumab, but I've initiated osimertinib. So I think the risk of extrapolation is there, but I don't, I don't really see that happening um, in clinic all that often. And I, I just want to wrap up with one other question about how bothered are you or is it me just uh, really getting hum hung up on, you know, seeding control of our standards of care and practice patterns based on basically pharma approaches, you know, pharma gamesmanship? Because I, we, we have historically had overall survival as the primary endpoint in adjuvant. And, and we never spent 10 seconds debating DFS for chemotherapy. And more recently, bevacizumab was tested in an ECOG trial in, in North America. And they talked about DFS and immediately had a consensus that overall survival was the endpoint. Now, We've changed, and I don't know that the genie's ever going to go back in the bottle. Uh, you know that it's DFS, and you know we may be in a position of changing our practice based on 
pathologic CR rate and uh, without longer term endpoints, I have some concerns about about oncologists uh, having lost control of that narrative and that we are now beholden to follow basically pharma inspired pharma friendly endpoints that yeah we get an early return and yes i agree sanjay we'd all like to know the results but i would like to know the meaningful results and not be treating in a way that is really without any knowledge of the meaningful endpoints based on getting you know this is to me the street lamp effect of i want overall survival not the surrogate endpoints and I, I don't want to be just, you know, looking for my keys where the light is better. Um, and because this is what is, you know, suits pharma the best in designing a trial. I, I don't know if I'm just being a curmudgeon here. So uh, I'm interested in your thoughts before we wrap up. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you you make a very valid point, Jack. And I don't think it's one that we can ignore. Um, you know, overall survival is the um, gold standard endpoint for. Uh, adjuvant studies and really we should be um, pushing to make sure that that does you know as best as possible remain what we can test um, the, the problem that we have is that the world of drug development has has changed markedly over the past 20 years you know you can't just pick up a piece of paper, design a protocol, run a trial anymore. You know, running a trial is a complex, multi-million dollar um, uh, enterprise. It requires CRAs, and you and I have all discussed the problems about the logistical issues about run, running a trial. Um, it has huge regulatory burdens, which never we used to have. Uh, uh, before and so the, the, the concept of um, running an academic study in a space where pharma has a vested interest, I just think is is next to impossible. Um, so the genie is out of the bag or out of the bottle, as as you would say. Um, Jack, you know, DFS is here. We're going to be getting even more blurred when we start talking about major pathological response. I mean, who knows what that means? Um, but I think, you know, we have to say, look, whatever the trials do read out, uh, we have to interpret them for our patients' best interest as best as we can. And I think we're going to really have struggle when we start running into surrogate endpoints with less uh, big uh, endpoints. You know, once we start running into small magnitudes of benefit, that's when the debate is going to get really quite tight. And in that setting, I'm not sure I'm running away with the horse. You know, I think we have to have some semblance of sanity here. This has been a great conversation. Um, and I, just for the record, Jack, you're not being a curmudgeon. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for joining us today, Sanjay. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you find your podcast content. We hope that you will subscribe and send us comments and feedback to beyondthejournalshow at gmail.com. We would like to thank Mark Lindsay and Talking Speaker for production and distribution support and see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. We'll, we'll have you back for an even more controversial one in the future. All right. Yeah, no, delighted, delighted. Happy to do this anytime. Always love uh, sharing the cut with you guys. Take care, folks. Okay, have a great day. Bye-bye.